Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, and sorry to interrupt the great conversations I know are happening at your tables. And uh, a warm welcome and a best of the season to all of you. My name is Adam Legg, President and CEO of the Calgary Chamber, and very delighted to be bringing you our final event of 2014, our address from His Worship, Mayor Nahed Nenshi. I think it'd be an understatement to say it's some interesting times here in Calgary. Uh, we're, uh, we're seeing uh, a very challenged business environment. Uh, we are really trying to find our way in for what many people new to the, newer to this city uh, have not gone through before, but for many people who I've talked to they have said to me, Adam, I've seen this before, we got through it then, we'll get through it this time. And I believe that. And it is through the tough job of our elected officials that help us get through that. And it is a tough job. You know, it's, it's a thankless job. You're up and deciding the future of the city, and you're really just fielding all the complaints and the challenges. But it is truly one of the most important jobs in this city, and, and no job more important than the mayor of this great city. Dealing with issues of growth and competitiveness, quality of life, quality of business environment, and what our city should be for the future. And so it's through that lens that we will view these interesting times of challenged energy prices and budgets being cut, knowing that Calgary has been here for over 120 years and we're still going to be here for over 123 years. Some years might be a little tighter than others, but I know if there's one thing that rings true is that this city, particularly this business community, is strong, it's resilient, it's innovative, and it's pragmatic. And it knows how to handle these situations. And I'm confident that not only our business community, but our civic leaders will have the foresight to lead us through. In that vein, I'm also very excited to announce today the release of this document, which is a great city's report. It's been a year in the making, a report that compares our city to other centers around the world, cities like Singapore, Rio, Madrid, on areas of housing, innovation, open data, finance, and truly creates a variety of recommendations of how to move forward. And we share this with, uh, with His Worship and, and City Council, and we hope that they're considering some of these recommendations as they move forward. Important findings like the conclusion that if we invest more in housing, we spend less on social services. There are innovative finance and service delivery solutions to our current needs, but there are changes that need to be made to let them happen. And that cities should actively embrace innovation and technology to improve quality of life and quality of business and be about open data. So I ask you to grab a copy on your way out or go to the Calgary Chamber website, download a copy and uh, mull it over over the holidays. And tell us what you think because we think there's some good ideas in there. We want to thank the Alberta Real Estate Foundation for their support in making that project possible. And in terms of today, the wonderful events like this we couldn't make possible without some great companies supporting us as sponsors. I want to recognize our presenting sponsors today, Shaw and Alberta Blue Cross, supporting sponsors of ATCO Group, Intact Insurance, NMAX, the Calgary Airport Authority, Mattamy Homes, PCL, Scotiabank, RGO, Bank of Montreal, TD Bank of Canada, and Spectra Energy. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in thanking our sponsors for today. It's my pleasure to introduce our head table this afternoon. Uh, our speaker today, His Worship, Mayor Nahed Nenshi. John Piercy, Senior Vice President with Shaw Business. David Swanson, Board Chair of the Calgary Airport Authority and Director of Business Development for GEC Architecture and a former Calgary Board Chamber Chair. Jerry Rudelik, Vice President, Group and Individual with Alberta Blue Cross. Diana Stevenson, Director of Governance and Stakeholder, Shareholder Relations with NMAX. 
Don Barano, Calgary Division President with Madame e. Holmes. Siegfried Kiefer, Chief Operating Officer of Power and Utilities with ATCO Group. Darren Godfrey, Deputy Senior Vice President, Claims with Intact Insurance. Doug Mitchell, Partner, Borden Ladner Gervais and former Calgary Chamber Board Chair. And Chima Nakendram, Chief of Staff to Mayor Nahed Nenshi of the City of Calgary. Now, if you'll permit me to take a brief moment, today is, as I mentioned, our last event of 2014. And, and there are two groups, three groups actually, who rarely get some of the spotlight that they deserve. And I want to just take a very brief moment to do so. And the first is our fantastic board of directors of the Calgary Chamber. They, uh, they provide countless hours of guidance, uh, oversight, counsel, and support to the organization and staff. And they are truly among Calgary's most incredible business leaders. Uh, and I want to take a, a moment to say thank you to all of the board for their work throughout 2014. We have a number of them with us today. Uh, we have Guy Huntingford who is departing uh, from our board at the end of this year. We have Denny Panchaud who is our 2015 vice chair. Phil Roberts, Carlos Alvarez, David Allen who is our 2015 second vice chair. Rob Hawley is our 2015 board chair. Linda Shea, Wellington Holbrook and incoming board member Brent Cooper. So ladies and gentlemen, join me in a round of applause for the great work of our board chair. The second group are all those people in the back of the room who you see usually not eating and making sure everybody here is having a great time and that is the wonderful people that I get to spend each and every work day with and that is the staff of the Calgary Chamber. They're an awesome group. They are working every day to help make your business more successful, whether it is through events like this, whether it is through shaping policy, or whether it is helping you get the most out of your membership. So I just want to take a moment and ask all the Chamber staff to just quickly stand, give a wave, or if you're standing, wave, and just a big thank you to all the wonderful work you do day in and day out. And finally, to the core of volunteers that we have, whether they serve on our policy committees or whether they're helping you today with, with seating and knowing where you're going, we're just so blessed to have a group of people who are willing to give of their time and uh, to help further this organization and what they do in Calgary. So a big round of applause for our volunteers. So on to the main event. I would ask you to turn your phones to silent or vibrate but in uh, concert with the mayor's excellent social uh, media capabilities, don't uh, put the phone away. Please follow the conversation on Twitter if you like. The handle is at Calgary Chamber. I know the mayor can't tweet while he's talking. He's tried, sometimes he does. He has taken selfies of the audience, but he usually has to, has to speak. So do follow it on Twitter. Uh, we will be doing our question and answer period if we have time, our infamous lightning round near the very end. So there are Q&A cards on your table. Please fill one of those out. If you have a question, a chamber member will come around and collect those from you. It's now my pleasure to introduce John Piercy, Senior Vice President of Shaw Business, to introduce Marina Hedenshi. John. Thank you, Adam. And thank you for, for all of you for joining us today. We are pleased to be here alongside Mayor Nenshi and the Calgary business community to participate in this worth, worthwhile discussion regarding the state of business in our city. Calgary has been home for Shaw for almost 20 years, and in that time we've seen the city blossom into a major economic success story and a huge driver of technology and innovation. We have a thriving business community that is routed in our vibrant population, strong entrepreneurial spirit, and tremendous potential for continued growth. As Canada's leading network and content experience company, we are proud to have deep roots right here in Calgary. Indeed, the city is home to thousands of Shaw employees and their families and hundreds of thousands of our customers. We are also pleased to be an active partner with the city and to work with them to launch new and innovative programs, such as their public access Wi-Fi program. We're also proud to be close partners during times of need and to work closely with the city to support actions and initiatives that make an impact on the lives of Calgarians. 
The strong leadership led by Mayor Nenshi and the business leaders like yourselves has enabled businesses like Shaw to grow and prosper. Mayor Nenshi, I have to look, there you are back there, Mayor Nenshi, your unwavering leadership and timeless dedication to the improvement of our city has created an enviable environment for our business community and has allowed it to thrive. Calgary is also very proud that Mayor Nenshi is in the running, along with 25 others, for the award and distinction of Mayor of the World competition to be announced in January. And I understand the bathing suit part of that competition is going to be aired on Shaw TV, so look forward to that. So a very honored distinction indeed. Mayor Nenshi, you are seemingly everywhere in, the, everywhere in the city in a day, ensuring that no cause is overlooked and that no citizen's concern is left unanswered. On behalf of the Shaw family and all of our colleagues, we are excited to participate in Calgary's continued growth and to work together as partners to move our city forward. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the podium Canada and soon the world's best mayor, Mayor Nahid Nenshi. Thanks so much. Well, thanks, uh, thanks so much, John. I have to tell you that my chief of staff, Chima, is sitting next to me, and every time anyone mentions that competition, which, by the way, I had absolutely no idea who those people are, where it came from, or anything, every time anyone mentions it, Chima cringes. And I say, won't it be awesome if I win? And he says, I can't live with you now. <laughs> I can't imagine what it'll be like. Okay, before I begin, I see that Ken King is sitting here, and I feel the need to tell you uh, about an important acquisition that we are making. I had a really great weekend with Ken King a couple of weekends ago. I hope all of you enjoyed that great weekend. I want to highlight that it was broken before I got it. <clears throat> but it gave me an idea. You see, my colleagues at Calgary Economic Development have been after me for some time, saying we need new Welcome to Calgary signs because the Welcome to Calgary signs say Heart of the New West, and we're not using that tagline anymore. And I keep saying, bring back Heidi and Howdy, and then they get mad at me, and they keep giving me a budgetary request for new signs. And as you all know, I am um, very cheap, frugal, I prefer. So the good news is, I hear there's these signs outside of Edmonton that they're selling for cheap. <laughs> and the way the flames are playing, we might need those. And all that without a new arena. Ooh, did I say that out loud? All right. <laughs> Let's talk about the state of business in our community. We're coming to the end of 2014. We're coming to the holiday season, uh, to the season of reflection and of giving, and this is a good time to reflect. It's also a strange time to reflect, because as you heard from Adam, in a very, very short period of time, we're starting to feel a little wavering in that un unending, never wavering confidence here in the city of Calgary. And certainly one number that we look to a lot as an indicator of ec our economic health has been going pretty sheep, sharply south, south of $62, in fact. But I also want to remind you that in this community, we are about much, much more than one number. We're about much, much more than geopolitics and what geopolitics mean to our community. And that's really what I want to focus on today, about all the other things that we are about. There's going to be a lot of opportunity for us to talk about whether we're in a price trough or a bubble and what that's going to mean to the rest of the community. And already the Cassandras and the soothsayers are coming out saying this is what it's going to mean to the real estate market. This is what it's going to mean to employment. We don't know. But we'll have a lot of opportunity to talk about that and to think about that going forward. I see that the Chamber is bringing in the Federal Minister soon and we'll have lots of opportunity to continue those discussions. But I also want to say, let's not forget, and let's not put out of our minds just how well we're doing. Calgary continues to be the best city in Canada to start and grow a business. According to FDI Intelligence, Calgary is the second most business-friendly city in North America, and the third in economic potential. And let's not forget that once again this year, the Economist Intelligence Unit, and they do know what they're talking about, ranks Calgary as one of the top five cities in the world in which to live. 
And sometimes we forget about how big a deal that is for a city of 1.2 million people in the middle of the frozen prairie, caught up in our own arguments and discussions and thoughts about the future. Sometimes we forget about what we've actually created here and the extraordinary thing that we've created here. And I think it's important to remind ourselves every now and then of doing it. I always tease a certain newspaper columnist because he is congenitally unable to be happy. Well, that's why he's in the newspaper business, I guess. Because every time I talk about stuff like this, he just rolls his eyes. And my favorite part is in his most recent column, his response was just, whatever. So he can't actually argue these things, uh, and he's stuck with being a 13-year-old girl, it sounds like. And the reason he can't argue these things is because he's inarguable. And I don't apologize for making the job of a City Hall columnist difficult, because it's hard to find things to complain about. Uh, I think that's a good thing. And of course, in our most recent citizen satisfaction survey, the numbers continue to be extraordinary. And when you come down to it, it's the perspective of the people that live here. The people who go to work here every day and get the kids ready for school and have their days and play hockey and enjoy living in this community. It's their perspective that matters the most. In our most recent citizen satisfaction survey that we released just a few weeks ago, 91% of you are proud to be a Calgarian. 86% of you feel that the quality of life here is great. 86% of you agree that Calgary is a great place to make a living. 85% of you agree that Calgary is a great place to make a life. 89% of you agree that Calgary is on track to be a better city 10 years from now. I give those numbers every year. And sometimes I need a little bit of perspective. So our new city manager, I can't say new anymore because I think you've hit the six month mark, but Jeff Fielding is in the room today. And Jeff was sitting with me when these numbers were released with his jaw hitting the ground. And I said, oh no, we slipped a little bit. We went from 91% to 90% over here. And he looked at me and he said, you understand that every city does this survey, right? And you understand that these numbers are extraordinary, that nobody feels about their city and about their civic government the way they do here. And by the way, he pointed out, he was much too, he was, I'm much too polite to point out what he did, have you noticed how much the numbers have gone up since 2010? I don't know what happened in 2010. So, yes, we're a little bit nervous about what's going forward, about what will happen, but I'll remind all of you that we were also nervous at the end of 2008. And this city and this region, although we certainly had some pain, got through that better than just about anywhere else in the world. And I think that that has a lot to do with the confidence and the optimism of the people that live here. And the fact that we think about what we are going to be and what we are going to do in the future. And I think that makes an ideal environment for a thriving business. Let me talk a little bit about the business of the city of Calgary. The business of the community, but also what we as an organization are doing to make sure that Calgary remains the best place in Canada to start and grow a business, which is, by the way, one of our objectives. So you'll know that we've just approved our first ever four-year budget and business plan. I'm going to tell you something. All year, I've been really nervous about that budget and business plan. I've got a new council. We're kind of feeling our way around. We're figuring out who we are and what we want for the community. And I was concerned that we wouldn't be able to find any four-year budget that really reflected what the community needed. I was actually worried I wouldn't be able to get eight votes for any budget. And I was thinking about what that meant for us as a community. In fact, in the end, it passed 14 to 1, which means I spent a lot of time this year worrying about nothing. Or it means that we spent a lot of time together as a council trying to figure out what the community really wanted, what your objectives are, what your needs are, what your hopes and fears and dreams and challenges for our community are, and coming up with something that I think makes a lot of sense. Within that budget, we have efficiencies and savings baked in. We've saved over $135 million in efficiencies over the last three years. There's $50 million in more efficiencies over the next four years. Now, Calgarians consistently tell us Every way you ask, every manner in which you ask, Calgarians consistently tell us they want more and better service. Whether it's longer hours on transit, or a change to how we do snow removal, or more rec centers in more parts of the city. Calgarians also tell us that they're proud of having the lowest property taxes of any large city in Canada. So, 
How do we manage to meet both of those things? Well, we do it by ensuring we're focused, that we're efficient, and that we're lean. And it may sound funny to talk about government as being efficient and lean. We are efficient and lean. And we continue to find more efficiencies in everything that we do. And over the next four years, you're going to see a bunch of changes in the community. On transit, those of you who take the train in the mornings will be very excited when the four-car train service starts to alleviate congestion, particularly during rush hour. Those of you who live in places that are poorly served by transit currently will soon be able to board the Green Line Transit Way, as well as seven other rapid tra bus rapid transit routes throughout the city. We'll continue to invest in flood resilience and ensuring that we are ready for natural disaster wherever it comes. We'll continue to build new fire stations, a new 911 system, new fire police and bylaw officers will be hired, and much, much more. And yes, as people always say, do you build roads? Yeah, we build a lot of roads. <laughs> we'll, finally, uh, we'll finally widen McKnight Boulevard Northeast. I'm sorry for those of you who enjoy your favorite roller coaster every day. That is getting fixed. Uh, as well as three major new intersections throughout the city. Business specific things include we're continuing to phase out the business tax, so we will soon ha no longer have a standalone business tax, and we will in fact have a consolidated non residential property tax. Doesn't that sound exciting? Say that 10 times fast consolidated non residential property tax. But that'll save both the business taxpayer and the city a great deal in administrative costs. Our cut red tape program continues to yield results. Millions of dollars, millions of hours of time saved for citizens who are doing business with the city of Calgary. I'll give you one little example. A little project that we call e-construction. And in bureaucraties, e-construction translates to online concurrent and collaborative review of engineering drawings. Doesn't that sound exciting? It's just been, uh, it's just been implemented this year. It's already saved $10 million for the construction industry in Calgary. These are good things. They continue to work uh, well for people. But although we only talk about the budget, the budget wasn't just a budget, it was actually a business plan, a four-year business plan for those services that touch every single one of you every single minute of the day. And at this time of year, I don't mind reflecting a little bit on this. Ever since the flood, you've heard me say that one of the big lessons we learned from the flood is that we are tremendously lucky to live in a place where government works where dedicated public servants go to work every single day to keep us safe and to make our communities better. It's something that we are not, that is not shared by many people in this world. And it's something that I certainly live my life in gratitude for. And I think we all should. I was just thinking this week that in this city we have about 500,000 buildings. Some of them are houses, some of them are skyscrapers, everything in between. And every single one of those buildings, half a million, every single one of those buildings has a tap in it. And every single one of those taps gives fresh, clean, healthy, safe water every second of every minute of every day of every week of every month of every year. There are a billion people in the world who don't have that privilege. There are a billion people for who, in the world for whom quenching your thirst can kill you. And the fact that we can live our lives without thinking about things like that. Because my dedicated colleagues who work in the sewer plant and my dedicated colleagues who work in the wastewater treatment plants know exactly what they're doing. And they go to work every single day to make sure that we are safe. And I think that that is an important thing for us to think about. The world is not all sunshine and roses. I like to think sometimes it is. But it's not. And I know for many of you in this room, the last six weeks or so have brought a number of extremely difficult decisions you have to make, extremely big challenges about the futures of your companies, about the future of the people, the women and men that you work with every single day. But as I said before, it's about more than one number. It's about more than just the price of oil. The challenges that businesses face, particularly small and medium-sized businesses, are, crit are more complex than that. They're more complex than the size of your tax bill. They're more complex than WTI this week. And one of the things that is very clear in this place, regardless of where we are right now as an economic, in an economic status, is that a lot of these challenges relate to people attraction. I spent a lot of my time over the last four years talking to people 
across Canada and around the world, telling them about living here, investing here, being in this marvelous place. And a lot of that has to do with making sure that all of you in business, in small business and large business and everything in between, are able to get the people who can do the job required at the wage you can pay for your growing business. And we continue to have a labor crunch. We continue to believe our forecasts haven't changed, that we'll need 200,000 more workers in this region by 2020. And we've got to figure out how to do that. Last year, one in 10 jobs in Canada was created in the Calgary region, mostly in the city of Calgary. And issues like changes to the temporary foreign worker program, like poverty, like inequality, like the crisis we're currently facing in housing, like the increasing cost of living in Calgary, can only exacerbate this problem. And so we as a city and a community need to take this time. And if this time means a short pause in our unrelenting growth, then let's take the opportunity to exhale, to take a deep breath and work together to figure out how to keep building this great city. So when I say that, what kind of a city am I talking about? What kind of a place are we building here? You've often heard me say the same thing, which is that the power of this place, the power of who we are, of what we do together, is encapsulated in a very simple promise. And that very simple promise is one that most people in the world do not share. And that simple promise is simply this, that every single person in every single corner of this community, regardless of what they look like, or where they came from, or how they worship, or whom they love, that every single person in every single corner of this community has the opportunity right here, right now, to live a great Canadian life. That's what we fight for every day. And folks, that is actually the best way to solve our labor shortages. That's why I raise it today. So to all of you, to this business audience today, I want to tell you that it's not just my job. It's not just the job of the nonprofit sector to ensure that we meet that promise of a city where everyone has that opportunity. It's the job of all of us, and particularly it's the job of business. I'm giving you homework today. The first bit of homework is, when you get back to the office this afternoon, I want you to go to your human resources departments. And I want you to ask a simple question. How are our hiring practices in our business ensuring that we are maximizing the potential of the people that live here? In particular, I would like every one of you to commit to going to your human resources department and removing two dirty words from your hiring criteria. And those two dirty words are Canadian experience. To ensure that we are hiring new Canadians and giving them the opportunity to set themselves up in this country and in this city and in this community, in that first job, without fear of reprisal, without fear of, under, of feeling that their qualifications and their background will not be valued here. I had a conversation a couple years ago with a bunch of really senior leaders uh, in the corporate sector, many of whom are in the room today. And it was a very open-ended conversation. And we just said, you know, what are the challenges you're facing? And the number one challenge these folks came up with was this. They said immigration, labor shortage, figuring out how to hire people. And one of them said to me, you know, Mayor, it's terrible, the system we have. I went down to my mail room, and I met the new guy who's working there. And do you know he has two PhDs? And he's working in my mail room because he couldn't find anything else. And I looked at the senior corporate leader and I said, I am completely unmoved by your story. And he was a bit shocked. And he said, why are you unmoved? And I said, well, now that you know that he's there, is he still working in the mail room? Did you find a job for him? Is he your assistant now in your big corporation? Have you figured out a way to get him out of the mail room? Because that's not what this is about. It's not about telling the mayor to get him out of the mailroom. It's about every single one of us trying to figure out how to do that. 
Now, before I go too far, I should tell you that small and medium-sized businesses in Calgary have been much better at this than some of our larger employers. In fact, small and medium-sized businesses have been more affected, uh, as I alluded to earlier. I can't describe it in any other way. By the unmitigated mess that we're in as a result of changes to the temporary foreign worker program. And as an aside, I will tell you that I will continue to be a strong advocate for reform of that program that not only meets the needs of business, but that also meet the needs of the people who serve us coffee in the morning. That every single one of those persons deserves dignity and they deserve a path to citizenship. And the changes to the temporary foreign worker program do exactly the opposite. They hurt business and they hurt the temporary foreign workers. And we need to find a way, and we can do it as Canadians, where we generously share opportunity with these folks, as well as filling these critical labour market needs. And I hope that the federal government will continue to make this program work instead of making it worse. But this stuff has to be systemized. It really does. There's a guy I work with in my office. He's a security guard. He's originally from Pakistan, but immediately before he came to this country, he was the vice president of a bank in Dubai. He has an MBA. He's working as a security guard. He actually really loves it. He says he does anyway, because he gets to work with me, I guess. And sure enough, I'm hopeful that he's going to get a great job in a Canadian bank soon. But it shouldn't have to be the fact that the mayor happened to be sitting next to the CEO of one of the five chartered banks and telling him the story of the security guard that gets the security guard a better job. It has to be something that together we work on and we make sure it's part of what we do every day. I talk a lot about new Canadians. I need to tell you that in addition, maximizing the value that people can bring of the people who are here already means every single one of us has to do a far better job working with First Nations people and ensuring that Aboriginal Canadians also have the opportunity to get great work and to do well in our communities. And I'll t tell you, my own organization, the City of Calgary, is not a shining example of this, has not been a shining example of this. I learned in my first term that while we were facing a terrible labour crunch, we did not have one single person from the Sutina Nation working for the City of Calgary. I don't need to remind you that the Sutina Nation is across the street. And we just never thought about it. A pocket of high unemployment across the street from the city and we would never thought about it. So we made some simple changes. We send our job postings over to the band office. Every now and then we do a career fair and let people know about the opportunities we have. These small things can make extraordinary difference to business success and more important, to people's lives, so we continue to do that. Get rid of Canadian experience, that's your first piece of homework. Your second piece of homework. The other way in which business can make an extraordinary change in the work that we do, particularly around poverty, is in your supply chains. So I want all of you to go to your supply chain department, to your purchasing department. My dad was an old purchaser, I kind of get this stuff and ask them the same question. What are we doing through the way that we buy goods and services in order to ensure the success of wealth creating entrepreneurs in our community? So for the city of Calgary, for example, that means looking really hard at the criteria that we use when we put out bids or proposals. Now my favorite example, one we haven't fixed yet, is when I was a consultant, uh, I used to bid on work with the city of Calgary and I got rejected every single time. I had to win an election to get a job with the city of Calgary. But one of the reasons I was rejected every single time is because the city had a rule that contractors need to have $2 million in liability insurance. I'm a sole proprietorship. I do strategic consulting. What the heck kind of liability am I gonna get into are people going to pass out from the smell of the markers on the whiteboard? Yet the city required this insurance, which was completely out of my scope, to be able to afford for a small two or three thousand dollar contract. Examples like that abound everywhere. 
And so I encourage all of you to go to your supply chain departments, to your purchasing departments, and say, look, how do we make sure that small business can bid on our work? How do we make sure that people who come from minority-owned companies who might not understand the system still understand that we have bids out there? How do we break the networks of our suppliers to ensure that others can get in there as well and do so in a way that's fair and that maintains shareholder value but continues to build wealth in our community. These things can happen, and these are the most powerful poverty-fighting tools we've got. So I encourage all of you to continue to do that. Number three. This is it for the homework. Maybe not. I might get to number four. In creating a welcome, inclusive city for all, we have to ensure affordability of housing. And working on affordability of housing means working throughout the housing spectrum. We have a situation right now where, as you all know, the price to buy a house has gone up extraordinarily. Working people who are renting are finding it extremely difficult to get the down payment, meaning they're staying in rental longer, forcing up the prices of rental housing. It means people who are working and should be in rental housing but cannot afford market rent or cannot find a place in a city with sub 1% vacancy are seeking subsidized government or affordable housing. It means that they're in government subsidized or affordable housing such that the people who are homeless and in the shelter system cannot find anywhere to go to get out of the shelter system. So basically the system is clogged top to bottom. Part of that is about changing the way we think about housing supply, which is something that the city has been working very, very hard on. But part of it too is creating escape valves at every level and ensuring that we can reduce some of that pressure at each level. So for example, your chamber president, Adam Legg, and I serve on the board of a wonderful little organization called Attainable Homes Calgary. And Attainable Homes Calgary is a complex model, but essentially it allows people who are earning a modest income but can't afford, cannot get themselves to save for a down payment into home ownership. And we've got 500 families into their first homes uh, over the last couple of years as a result of that. These sorts of ideas need to blossom. We need to figure out how to continue to help people. There is one thing, however, that would be really easy to do, and we really need to do it, and every other city in Canada has already done it, and I can't quite get there. So now, I'm not giving you homework, I'm begging for your help. There is no question in this city that we have to legalize secondary suites. We have to do it. There can be no more dithering, there can be no more fighting about this. It has to be done. Last Monday at City Council, I had a woman come to City Council because, as you know, our current broken, disgusting system forces every single person to come to Council and literally beg for their dignity in front of City Council. One woman came and she said, you know, I wrote in my application that my teenage kids and my university-age kids are going to live in that suite, and that's true. But they will leave home soon, and I will retire, and I will not be able to keep my home in retirement unless I have the opportunity to get some rental income. Had another guy about my age, a little bit older than me, come and say, my parents have had a financial setback, and my mom is really sick, and they got kicked out of their house. And I want them to be able to live with me so that they can stay in town and be close to the grandkids because there's no way they can afford rent in our city. And then the dad came up and talked about his own situation and what had happened to his wife and talked about how it was hard for him to move in with his son, but it was the only choice they had. It was disgusting that we are forcing our fellow citizens and our neighbors to have to come and talk live on TV and on the web about these deeply personal issues just so that they can live a life with dignity and live in a safe, dignified place. We strip them of the dignity in order to get them a dignified place. It has to end, and it has to end now. So that is what I am pleading with you with. <laughs> on Monday, City Council will be having a very serious discussion that serious discussion will be around making secondary suites a discretionary use in communities that do not currently allow them. It's not quite what I've been proposing for four years. 
to use a Ken King analogy, it's not quite the touchdown, but it gets us to first and goal. I'm happy about it. We have to get there, even though it doesn't take us quite as far as every other city in Canada. And I hope that we will have a new bylaw next year. But it's going to be close. So I'm asking you to do something I very rarely ask. I want you to call your councillors today when you get back to the office. I particularly want you to call, I'm going to get in trouble for saying this, I want you to call Councillor Peter DeMong, Councillor Shane Keating, Councillor Sean Chu, Councillor Joe Maglioka, Councillor Ray Jones. I have councillors who will never vote for this. For whatever reason, their minds are closed. I have councillors that will vote for anything because they're desperate to make a difference. Those five are thoughtful, smart, and open-minded, but they need to hear from business about how important this change is, about how you need places for your employees to live, about how those homes need to be available to people at every income level, and how very few of you can, only, can, can afford to hire only people who have half-million-dollar mortgages. And let me say one thing. The group of people who have been in favor of secondary suites is an extraordinary group across the city. Every religious organization, the builders, the developers, every student organization, every nonprofit, every poverty organization, it's absolutely overwhelming. Who knows who's on the other side? But I want to say one thing, which is that the leadership of the Calgary Chamber of Commerce, especially the personal leadership of Adam Legg, has been very, very important in this. And if we get there on Monday, if we get to first and goal on Monday, it has a lot to do with the advocacy of the Chamber. So I want to say thank you for that. You know, a really important part of my job is to pitch. I pitch the city to people from across Canada, and when I make that pitch, it may surprise you to know, I always get the same question. And I bet that question is going to surprise you. Because you live here and you wouldn't think that this is a question. And the question I always get is, is Calgary welcoming? Is it homophobic? Is it racist? Is it diverse? Not only will I be accepted, but will my friends <laughs> be accepted? And of course, I always say, look at me. I'm the mayor. We're very welcoming, and for the vast majority of us, this place, our home, is the absolute epitome of meritocracy, of multiculturalism, of pluralism, of support, and of success. But I gotta tell you, the last couple weeks in the provincial legislature have not made my job any easier. This damaging and hateful debate that we've been having in the provincial legislature around Bill 202 and Bill 10 does nothing but reinforce negative stereotypes. Two weeks ago, a member of the Legislative Assembly got up and proposed a bill that said, any kid in school can set up a club. And suddenly, our provincial legislatures, in a time when the price of oil is dropping, in a time where our infrastructure needs are extraordinary, in a time where we have urban and regional issues that we've got to get worked on, spent two weeks talking about what club a kid in school can join or not. How ridiculous is that? How additionally ridiculous is it that we know that these clubs help kids stay safe? We know that these clubs prevent suicide? among a group where one-third of the kids attempt suicide? And we have the gall to say we have to balance off your rights? That your right doesn't include the right to be safe? To have support from, to prevent you from attempting suicide? What kind of a world do we live in here? So thank you very much to the Premier, who is a good guy for putting the brakes on this thing and putting this thing on pause. Because what was happening was dangerous. By saying not all rights are absolute, the government attempt to seem to be saying that our children don't have the right to be safe. That's not right. That's not fair. I could go on and on. Okay, I will. 
if we say that we live in a city where we were thinking it would be okay for a 15-year-old to appear before a judge, to ask the judge if the 15-year-old can start a club in his school, a club that no one would be forced to belong to, well, folks, that would be the Scopes Monkey Trial of Alberta. We would end up having international attention towards what kind of hillbillies we are. None of us need that. Today is the day for us to say straight out that we are indeed welcoming, that we are indeed working hard to make sure that every single person can succeed here because that is the core of our strength. And I wanna say something else to you. I'm gonna get political for a second. I rarely get political, as you know. And by the way, I hate it when the province talks about municipal issues. And so I've been holding my tongue on this for a while. But at the end, we have to talk about humanity. And we have to talk about human rights issues and what makes our place successful. We often hear people talk about why they vote. And sometimes we vote because we don't believe or we do believe in a certain tax. Sometimes we vote to protect our narrow self-interests. But this conversation that we've had over the last couple of weeks gives us a very interesting reason to vote. Because sometimes, we gotta vote just for what's right. We gotta vote for that kind of community we want. We gotta vote for our dreams. And this would be a wonderful opportunity for you to let your MLAs know that your vote is available. That your vote is available for people who are committed to making Calgary and Alberta welcoming to everyone to make sure that everyone, no matter what they look like, no matter where they come from, no matter whom they worship, no matter how they love, has the opportunity to live a great life right here. And that we will vote for that community. And that we will vote for the community that we want. And tell your MLA to do the right thing by these kids. <laughs> Surprisingly, I've gone over time which I often do, but I want to end with something. We live in the best place in the world. That's not just me saying that as a politician. It is the best place in the world, and we are lucky to live here. But there's still poverty. There's still lack of affordable housing. There's still an un, and sometimes an unwelcoming environment, and we need to work together to make that happen. Sometimes I'm accused of being too happy of always talking about wonderful things, about what a great place we are, and showing us only the best of ourselves. Guilty as charged. But I'll also tell you that for the last little while, I have been a little bit troubled. I've been seeing cracks, and I'm hopeful that those cracks are not leading to a broader issue. Neighbors fighting neighbors on issues like secondary suites or the availability of social housing in neighborhoods a feeling of exclusivity to certain communities. This is who I am, this is who we are, we don't want any of you. You can ask me later how I feel about a little gate on a little island in Southeast Calgary. You can probably guess how I feel about that. We have communities where people are fighting the creation of new schools, precisely because their own kids won't go to those schools. One of those, by the way, is a community fighting the building of a school for kids with severe physical disabilities, who I think deserve a safe and accessible place to go to school. We got a community that launched a huge fight because God help us, we were building a playground in a public park and none of their kids used the playground and it would bring in kids from another block. We had a big debate over a piece of parkland that we finally resolved on Monday. It was actually pretty easy to resolve. It would have been pretty easy to resolve, even easier, if we hadn't had almost two years of misinformation, disrespect, and yelling at one another from both sides. And in one community, a four-foot-tall fence that was decided upon after years of consultation in the community led to reports of people throwing rocks at the city workers building the fence. If a four-foot fence bugs you that much, you need better priorities, I say. But things like that have given me a bit of a punch in the gut. And not just because it's horrible 
but because it's not the community we stand for. It's not my Calgary, and it's not your Calgary. And I'm calling these things out today precisely because it's not who we are. But I'm also going to remind you that it really isn't who we are. Over the last 18 months, we in this community have been faced with extraordinary challenges and trials and tribulations. I could do without any more emergencies. When the locusts, the zombies, and the aliens come, I'm done. I'm moving to Maui. But despite those trials and tribulations, we've also seen an extraordinary amount of triumph, of community triumph. And as we get close to Christmas, I want to tell you about some Christmas spirit that I experienced some time ago when I saw the Christmas spirit in June. June 21st, the first year anniversary of the flood, I declared something called Neighbor Day. I kind of hated the name, but I declared it anyway. And I reminded people that in every community, to spend a day with your neighbors, that's all I said, spend a day with your neighbors, figure out how to do it, get to know your neighbors better, see what happens, as a way of commemorating how we came together after the flood. Man, oh man, I had a busy day that day. I went to every single corner of the city to work bees and barbecues and block parties in Beddington Heights. By the way, it's Heights, they were untouched by the flood. The community got together to build fences and paint the community fences. I went to a block party in Bridgeland with endless tables of food and neighbors talking about how they loved knowing who one another were. I went to a community called Lincoln Park. Many of you probably don't even know where Lincoln Park is, near Mount Royal University, a very small community made up of very, very, very different levels of income, as different as you can be, and just saw these kids, some of whom were brand new to Canada from war-torn refugee places, just having fun in the park. And the lady who volunteered that, had never volu volunteered to organize that, had never volunteered for anything before, and is now one of the most effective advocates in our community because she now talks about her own struggle with poverty. The community of Haysboro had the longest day of play they had a, because it was the solstice, they had a day of play all day, and they built a scoot park. I have no idea what a scoot park is. Apparently it's like a skate park, but for scooters. And I in my life would never have thought this community needs a scoot park. But the community figured that out, and they did it. The folks in Bowness hit hard by the flood, had a rockin' party with a great band, and they put little hearts on the trees out front of their houses just saying thank you to the community that had helped them. And I bet if you were to walk down Bow Crescent today, you'd still see some hearts nailed to some trees. But the thing that touched me the most was in a community in north central Calgary, again, untouched by the flood. They had a very, very simple neighbor day. All they did was they invited everyone to the community hall in the morning for some Tim Hortons coffee and donuts. And when they got to the community hall, they saw two big whiteboards. And on one of the whiteboards it said, I need. On the other whiteboard it said, I have. And the whole idea was you're supposed to write down what you needed or what you had, and the community would try and match people up and solve these things. And when I got there, an older woman had written, I need someone to fix my lawnmower. I've lost my husband, and the lawnmower is broken, and I don't know how to fix it. And someone on the other side had written, I can mow your lawn. That's community. That's who we are. That's what we do. Everyday people with their everyday hands and their everyday voices and their everyday wallets making extraordinary change in the community. That's the promise of who we are. That's the promise of what we do together as a community. So as we think about 2015, I encourage all of you to recommit yourselves. Recommit yourselves to community, to citizenship, and to compassion. As we start to go through a rougher stretch than we're used to, let's make sure that we're there for our neighbors. Let's make sure that we're there to catch them if they stumble and put them back on their feet. And let's make sure that we, everyday people, using our everyday hands and everyday voices and everyday wallets, are working every single day to make this community better. So for me and my family, to all of you, I just wish you the best of seasons, the merriest of Christmases, and the happiest of New Year's. Thank you all.
I went way over time. But here we are. There's no big chairs for us to sit in. I know, I round. know. Here we are, due to your lengthy speech, forced into a lightning round. I did that on purpose. Yes, I know. I love his lightning round. What can I do? So, uh, just for all of those, thank you very much for your, your comment about the Chamber's leadership on secondary suites. I'm not sure if you even know this, but this morning a pre media advisory went out that at 10 a.m. tomorrow at the Calgary Chamber offices, a broad group of Calgary's well-known businesses will be standing shoulder to shoulder talking about the importance of approving more secondary suites or permitting more secondary suites around this city. Uh, so for those of you that are able to lend your support, please come. Uh, but a lot of Calgary's most prominent companies will be there giving Great. a business voice That's for that. That's wonderful. Thank you. So, uh, Your Worship, a, uh, I guess we're in the lightning round. Go. Um, Answer them all. So, every year the city completes a citizen satisfaction survey. Why is there not a business satisfaction survey? Last I checked, businesses were made of people, and so we get to them anyway. But, of course, we're always interested, particularly in what small and medium-sized businesses do, and we have lots of ways to reach them, and I can encourage all of them to contact me. So, maybe some homework for you, Your Worship? Maybe a business, Sorry? maybe some, uh, homework for you, maybe a business survey in the future. Maybe I'll do that with the Chamber. Excellent. We'd love that. Um, City Council just recently passed, as you said, the budget, uh, which will see approximately 4.5% property tax increases. We know there are some utility fee increases coming, uh, particularly for large users of water, wastewater. What are you telling people to reassure that people that Calgary is still a competitive place to do business? Great question, and I wish I could answer it lightning format, but I'll, I'll try. Number one is remember that our taxes still excuse me, still remain the lowest of any major city in Canada. So from a competitive perspective, we're still there. But it would be a lie to say that council is not obsessed every day with the cost of living in this city. And while taxes and utility fees are a relatively small part of the cost of living or the cost of doing businesses, we have to remain vigilant on them. But we also have to keep up with inflation. That 4.5% number is actually not real. This is something I complain about all the time. Because of the way our taxes are calculated, if you get a raise or if you spend more this Christmas season, the provincial and federal governments automatically get more in income tax or in sales tax. In terms of the city, we automatically don't get more. So if the price of your house goes up, then our tax rate is automatically adjusted down so that we get the same number of dollars this year as we got last year. So the 4.5% increase is actually in, in, not over last year. It's an increase over an imaginary number that none of you paid, um, which is based on what your assessments went up by. Um, so it's going up about $5.95 uh, $5 per month for the average house, which is frankly more than I would like, but I don't think it's going to make a huge difference to the cost of living or of doing business here. You're right, that wasn't a lightning answer. Tried, sorry. Um, you mentioned Jeff, uh, new city manager here. Uh, I think a lot of people who try to do business with the city would say that there is a bit of a, some experiences of no, we can't do this, no, we can't do that. What are you telling Jeff in terms of how to make transforming government so that this is a conducive place to do business? So since I've been elected, I've been working hard on this project called Transforming Government. Uh, and we have enormous successes, but we're not there yet. And our successes tend to be sporadic and episodic. So, you know, the folks building the tallest um, skyscraper in Calgary's history were able to get a development permit in five and a half months, which is unbelievable extraordinary. And now our job is to figure out how actually to take those ideas and make them systemized so that it happens every time instead of only on special projects. And that's something we're working hard to do. But our general, uh, the general sense of business, doing business with the city, um, the satisfaction levels have gone through the roof. Good. Uh, I think we're running short on time, so I'm going to unfortunately bring the lightning, lightning round to a close because we do have a few more remarks at the very end here. Okay. So thank you, Your Worship. Thank you. And let me also say to you, Adam, thank you for this report. I haven't finished reading it yet. It's big. It is long. Um, but there is some great stuff in it. There's some stuff in it that you and I will be arguing over the next few months. Look but forward to it. But it is a beautiful recommendation. Um, and I love that you are getting involved in public policy in this way because the more voices we have, the more thoughtful voices we have, the better a job we do. Thank you Thank very you. much. It's now my pleasure to uh, invite Jerry Rudelick from Alberta. It's now my pleasure. Now my pleasure. Neither of them work. There we are. Jerry Rudelick from Alberta Blue Cross to officially thank Mayor Anenshi. Wow, that was great. 
Alberta Blue Cross is pleased to be a major sponsor for Mayor Nenshi's address to the Calgary business community today. As a proud member of the Calgary business community and the Chamber, and as the Alberta-based provider of employer group benefit plans to many of Calgary's leading companies and organizations, as well as individuals, we appreciate the exceptional leadership that Mayor Nenshi delivers, not only in times of crisis like the 2013 floods, but in the day-to-day -day execution of his office. Mayor Nenshi, it has been a pleasure for all of us to hear from you today. On behalf of Alberta Blue Cross and everyone in attendance today, we thank you for sharing your insights. We look forward to your dynamic leadership in the Calgary business community for years to come. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. And uh, I was remiss in not acknowledging a few special guests we had in the room, and quite candidly, is because I forgot the list at the table. So I apologize to all of you. But uh, very quickly, we have Consul General Tamura uh, from the Consulate of Japan with us today, His Worship Peter Brown with the City of Airdrie, uh, Elizabeth Cannon, President of the University of Calgary, Sharon Carey, the President of Bow Valley College, and the newly installed Chancellor of the University of Calgary, Dr. Robert Thurst. So, ladies and gentlemen, special guests with us today. So thank you all for this wonderful final event of 2014. Uh, we're so delighted that you joined us. Uh, once again, our supporters for this event today, presenting sponsors of Shaw and Alberta Blue Cross, supporting sponsors of ATCO Group, Intact Insurance, NMAX, Calgary Airport Authority, Mattamy Homes, RGO, PCL, Scotiabank, Bank of Montreal, TD Bank of Canada, and Spectra Energy. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, on your way out, please grab a, a card which will give you the uh, URL for the report that we launched today. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Have a wonderful holiday season and look forward to seeing all of you back in 2015. Thank you very much.